So today's session, um, uh, firstly, um, is really um, the cover page on slide one is really about um, party two and uh, ACR and working with F with the Fiji Beekeepers Association and Cooper and the team. Um, just a bit of background on myself. Uh, I've been involved in the food business for about 35 years. I was brought up on a farm. Um, and in that 35 years, I've worked in factories, managing people, running um, business and business development. I've had sales and marketing roles. Um, I've been an export manager, etc., And I've been involved in research for development probably over the last 10 years. Um, and that's a bit of a picture there. That's me uh, back in 65 uh, when I was responsible for the family goat. Uh, that, that goat um, um, was responsible for feeding four, four young boys for about 15 years. Um, so I've come from a rural background um, and you know, have a lot of relationships with rural people working in PNG and Fiji uh, over many years. And of course, in Australia, Indonesia, and, and Southeast Asia. So, in this in this um, role, I'm essentially assisting the Pacific Agribusiness Research for Development Initiative, which is um, called Party Two, um, and that's um, managed out of uh, Australia uh, by the University of Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, and um, today's purpose is really about increasing um you know honey sales essentially um just let me fix this up um and it's first it's first of a, a series of um hopefully webinars that are going to help beekeepers um this first one is obviously about uh, honey branding we hope uh, there will be a quality assurance and food safety one to follow up uh, in a month's time Labelling and packaging is also another issue that Cooper has been keen to um, get some support on. Um, and um, let me go back to it. Um, so we'll be asking for your suggestions on topics that are important to, at the end of the session. Um, so our support team, you've met Dr. Cooper uh, Shudden from Southern Cross University. University has done a lot of work um, uh, in beekeeping um, in Australia and in the region. Uh, Salote from Party 2, you probably have all met Salote uh, through the work she's been doing um, um, in Fiji. And of course, uh, Nilesh uh, Kuma and John Caldera who've been very helpful uh, in supporting this. These people are obviously here to help you um, and connect with whatever issues you might have out of this webinar or, or subsequent um, programs. So the, the next slide is really about where we've come from. Um, to get to the point today, we, there was a series of research surveys done under Party 2 um, back in 2020. Um, and those initial findings were made at a symposium uh, back in April. And many of you may have attended that. Um, so this work we're doing tonight is really about responding in terms of some of the things that came up out of that survey with retailers and with consumers. And John has kindly made that available through um, the Facebook groups. So you can get access to that information um, whenever you like through Facebook there. And you can connect through uh, to see what that um, was about. So one of the key things that came out of that uh, survey was really, um, we had the advent of COVID uh, and the pandemic and the decline in tourism trade. And um, it suggests to me as uh, looking at this from the outside that there will be great opportunity to focus on domestic market sales for honey. We know that the per capita consumption for honey in Fiji is quite low comparatively. It's only around 450 grams per person um, for the whole population of Fiji. Um, that's really an estimate, but it is low. Um, and we think that we could do whatever we can with industry to expand on the current range of products that are currently doing a great job in the marketplace. But we're also conscious there's a lot of producers that potentially might need help 
in improving their products and their presentation. So one of the key things that came out of the survey was we look, we need to improve the presentation um, of our products in Fiji. Um, and I think uh, it's also relevant to anyone who's coming in from PG, PNG listening to this, because I have a lot of experience as Cooper does in PNG, uh, working in retailers. Uh, and so we feel there's a lot of upside um, in, in that space. So the other thing the retailer survey said to us or so the, the, was basically that we needed to prioritize retail growth. Um, we want, our, the retailers advised us essentially that suppliers um, are important to them and they want to provide uh, floor space to good products. Um, but we also need to understand that retailers um, look at return on floor space not on supporting brands. And so retailers provide retail space, shelf space, um, but it's up to us as suppliers to position, promote and sell the honey uh, in that environment. So you can see there's a nice pretty picture there on slide seven, which shows a retail scene in Australia where um, it's not that dissimilar from what I've experienced in Fiji. Um, and on the right hand side of that picture, you can see uh, a retail, a honey retail category where there are a lot of product products that are competing for the hearts and minds of shoppers. And you can think about this 25, 30,000 uh, stock items in a supermarket. So it's very hard uh, to get yourself prominent. Um, and shoppers who actually experience supermarket shops um, have thousands of product choices. Right, and they buy from suppliers who they know and they can trust. So having your product placed in that retail environment is really important. And we think there's never a better time than now to kickstart your business, either new or current, and think about how you might um, step up your retail marketing efforts. So why branding? Why did we select this particular subject to talk about tonight? Well, the modern marketplace is full of lots of competition. Uh, consumers have lots of choices. Branding, presentation, location of your product is essential in giving your voice to stand out to shoppers. There are also other aspects such as pricing, promotion, product design, communications on your pack, etc which all play a role in increasing honey sales. So you really need to break through the clutter of those thousands of stock keeping items that are in the, in the supermarket and grab your customer's attention. So what is branding? In the simplest way, it's creating a specific name logo and an image of your product. So I've got some examples there of a couple of products out of New Zealand. Um, and what have they done really successfully there from that image? As you can see, they can, they've got a very strong brand name. It's strongly positioned on the pack. They've got a logo, which is a trigger towards the honeybee. Um, and they've got a descriptor about their product. And they've got different images. You can see the one on the right-hand side, which is the, the friend product, has a really clean, simple, um, transparent view of the product. Um, and it's got good appetite appeal. Whereas the other one is packed in a tub. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that these two companies have chosen to differentiate their products in their packaging in different ways. So the question is, who will buy? So you need to do your research and talk to your prospects. These two companies have done that, and that's what's driven their creative development of their product. So distinguishing your honey from your competitors is really a key thing to do. And you can see here, this company in Australia called Capilano um, has a very strong retail presence with a very strong branding, use of color and packaging options and sizes to differentiate itself, right? And it really does stand out when consumers are walking by the, the, the aisle, they can see very, very easily that brand product and um, they are more likely to, to inquire, 
especially if the product is, is, is located on the shelf at the at eye level, which is around the waist level, then they've got a very good chance of getting a sale, right? So what is branding? What you're offering that makes you a better choice from others. It makes a memorable impression in the buyer's mind. And if you apply it consistently in all the products that you put in the marketplace, it will allow your customers to know what to expect from you. And I'm just gonna give you an example here of a product out of New Zealand, um, uh, which has done this very easily. You can see the brand says something about the doctor improves my health. It contains special ingredients in the honey, right? There is a logo there, which is a, a logo about trust. So if there's a third party certifier, that means that product um, uh, can be trusted to a greater degree. Furthermore, it has the export quality brand, which says something about triggering in your mind some positive messages when you come across that product, whether it's on the supermarket shelf or whether it's online. So these key things are done, right, to attract customers to the product. And this particular product, for example, sells around 30 New Zealand dollars per kilo equivalent. It's on the lower price range. And if I take this thinking further, right, creating and communicating clear messages on the label about certain characteristics and some unique selling points right, helps position the product here as a premium product, right? And good packaging and labeling allows the customer, when they come across that particular product, to know what to expect for you, from you. So let's look at that a little bit deeper. The brand, am I concerned about my health? And we know honey has very strong linkages to health, right? It's not only a great product to taste and consume, um, but it's great um, and improves my health. And we know that tea tree oil as an antioxidant has some properties. So the selection of manure honey, maybe as a blend with other multi-floral honeys in that pack, uh, gives us more credibility. And the testing regime has proven that someone, right, that there is um, uh, those ingredients that the company claims exist. Furthermore, it must be good if it's export quality. So in this case that I've selected, honey is not just honey, right? It is, this particular company has tried to take this honey product, their honey product, Manuka Doctor, uh, into a different space than traditional honeys. So if you look at the, um, the 970 plus product, that is sold in New Zealand for $800 a kilo equivalent. Right, so we can see a quite a bit of significant difference between uh, these products in the range that is offered by Manuka Doctor. And Manuka Doctor as a company would be offering many different types of products um, to appeal to different groups of customers, wherever they may be. Whether they're in their overseas markets or in the domestic markets or the Australian market um, or anywhere in Europe or Asia where they are selling their products. So this is a really good example of a, uh, of a recent um, uh, trend in honey uh, marketing around the world, where we are pushing honey uh, in the medicinal space. So in the previous slides, nine to 10, I showed you that messaging and communicating is critical. And here are some critical tips for you to think about. When you're creating a brand name, a logo, that ties in with you, the image and personality you want to convey. So have a look at what you've got and run a comparison to, up to some others. Secondly, use graphics that resonate with your target market. And make sure those photos and those images are of high quality. And I think I've tried to show you in those examples some really high quality images. Select at least one core signature color in your logo. Uh, and if you want to add different colors, don't do more than two and three is my recommendation. 
select consistent fonts, right? Each on your on your um, brand selection and the the tag lines that I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, and check that your brand name is unique and has not been trademarked by and sold by other people, right? So whatever you select when you're selecting your brand logo, make sure uh, it's not competing, uh, copying other people. And then if you can register your product to protect the brand and ensure that it meets legal requirements in the Fiji and in PNG and elsewhere. So it's really important that, uh, I've got a little tag there on the bottom that whatever you select about your brand me message, make sure it's simple, it's stylish, it can be catchy, memorable, emotional, professional, adaptable, ageless. These are key things that I think are really important. Um, when you are looking at your brand and seeing how relevant it is. The next step is I'm gonna talk about is a tagline. A tagline is adding a catchphrase to your logo that communicates a message about your brand. A smart logo conveys your product's mission in a way that consumers remember and identify. Take some examples, Red Bull. Red Bull gives you wings. Everybody in the world understands that logo when they buy a can of Red Bull. Nike, just do it. It's a call to action. Fiji Water, one of the most popular water brands in the USA, is the Earth's finest water, right? So these are examples of taglines. And, um, and if you need to buy, and if you need to think about that, we can certainly help you in your thinking around those or you can go online um, and check out different marketing slogans used across the consumer market world that you might want to look at. Now, I'm just gonna give you some examples here uh, to inspire you further. These are two companies, Capilano, which is Australia's favorite honey, trusted since 1953, and Airborne, the Honey Guardians, where heritage runs through our honey. We've been around a hundred years. So, their tagline is really about pushing their traditional values, their history, right? Their credibility and the presence they've had in the marketplace for almost generations. These are important taglines for these companies and they are promoted at every particular instance they get the opportunity to. The next slide, 16, is really about brand positioning. We saw in the previous two examples, two companies trading on traditional and historical values, the heritage of those two companies. What they were saying was, our competitors might be able to offer similar services to us, but they can't replicate our brand resilience, our history, what we've built over the years. However, there are many other key aspects for you to consider. And I'll give you a couple more examples. We've already seen how Dr. Manuka um, is promoting their product. And here I've got a couple of examples here from a company in Tasmania, which has a, uh, a, a very popular premium leatherwood honey. Um, and I always have that in my house because when I'm looking for really premium tasting um, um, floral honey, I love leatherwood. And it's a great example out of my pantry. The second one is Beechworth. And Beechworth essentially um, is from Victoria. And Beechworth honey takes the name from the, from the place that it comes from, the origin, uh, and it's promoting the, the work they are doing in the environment um, with the 1% for planet donations they make to that organization. So we see there's many, many ways for you to look at how you are going to position your brand uh, potentially in the marketplace. The wrong positioning, of course, uh, that is not believable and not deliverable in the way that you deliver the promise to the customer uh, may not um, make you successful in the marketplace. So one of the key things that um, I look for in a brand is do I understand what customers want? What do, our, what do competitors do? And what can I do well, right? 
Um, and I want to find points where I can simply stand out in the crowd. What can I do that no one else can do? That's a serious question. Why do existing customers choose you over the competition? What are some of the key things you are good at in your product proposition? What can you honestly guarantee to deliver consistently over and over again? Right? And it's really critical here that branding is about your promise to your customers. So when you're creating something new, you cannot copy someone else's promise. And you can, you know, you can get on uh, Google and other, other resources and uh, Google USP and learn more about how you can create use unique selling points about your honey and your product service and your, your whole product mix. I'm gonna now move to another slide, slide 18, which is about brand touch points. When creating or refreshing your brand, and these are ways to contact and reach out to your customers. Consider how your brand message will be used today and in the future. And I'm gonna put a little diagram here which says, these are the types of vehicles I potentially will be looking at when I'm promoting my brand. This is where people are going to connect with me. And that's gonna be via things like the social networks, whether you're on Facebook or on, on Twitter or on WhatsApp or other social networks. How are people going to see my product? We're not promoting my product in the local marketplace or in retail or to people online. How am I gonna, what am I gonna show? You know, so I've, there's, a, there's a lot of little things here. My business cards, on my emails, uh, on voicemails, on vehicles, and things that I'm gonna do in the future. As you develop your brand in the marketplace, you're gonna come across these opportunities for communicating your brand message. And we call those touch points. Right, this is really, in my, my, I'm getting close to the end here, but I'm talking here about branding to your target customers. Who are your target customers? Where do they exist and how do I reach them? So first check to see what opportunities exist in your local marketplace. I call them informal channels, roadside stalls, selling from the farm gate, the local marketplace, and then progress your line of sight into the more modern organized channels that may not be in your geographic area. They may be maybe in Savo Savo, they may be in Nandi, they may be in Lambasa, they may be in um, Latoka, and they may be in Suva, right? What is happening in those marketplaces? And the way I look at it, and I've always looked at it for the last sort of 25 years particularly, is I look at it in terms of four, challenge, four groups of channels to market. And I prioritize my effort in defining new customers in those four channels. And they are quite different. Let me talk about them in a little more detail. Retail. For me, retail has always been the major space where I can actually get my products into thousands of consumers um, um, shopping baskets, right? The modern supermarkets, is basically selling in-home consumption via a shop or a retail outlet. We call, not commonly call them supermarkets or hypermarkets. Um, and in places where uh, large numbers of consumers and in some cases pre-COVID tourists would shop um, in places like Jacks and Tarpoos, not only for you know, um, handicrafts, but also for other consumer products. So retail is one of the real channels, real big channels that you need to think about. The second one is off-premise consumption of honey. And I call that the food service or the Horeca channel. Horeca stands for um, hospitality, restaurants, catering, canteens, fast food chains, 
airline caterers, ships chandlers. There are many opportunities in these food service spaces where we can actually need to understand to be able to sell and promote our product. So it's important for us to be able to factor that into our distribution strategy for our brand. The second, the third one, of course, is industrial. I call it industrial because it's selling my honey or my honey byproducts sometimes in bulk. What I make as a raw uh, product, I'm trying to sell to other processors and manufacturers who might use my honey in making their products, in adding it as ingredients, maybe to beverages, to make maybe a fermented honey mead, or to make other products. Um, and in the industrial market also has specific requirements in terms of the things that they want um, uh, from you as a potential supplier. And really the final channel that's really emerged, particularly over the last sort of five to 10 years, and more recently since COVID has been the online channel. And I think it needs to, it deserves to have its own sort of particular focus because it's challenging the traditional bricks and mortar um, distribution of products by direct fulfillment with shoppers buying online using their smartphones or their computers to click pay online and get fulfillment and delivery of that product. Um, and you probably have used that to some degree while you've been locked up. Uh, like we have been recently in recent times in Australia to get some of those products and services that you need. So really when we are branding our target customers, we need to think about these particular four channels to market. And that has a great impact on how you go about branding, uh, labeling, packaging your products in the future and the prioritizing that you do in which channels you want to work in. Ultimately, you want to work in all those four channels. And I think if I go back to some of those examples that I showed you tonight, you'll probably find when you explore those companies that I gave you those examples, those companies are all in those four channels, right? They are trying to balance their whole distribution strategy and their whole marketing push to appeal to consumers and shoppers who are going to use their products in those four channels. Of course, there's also the export channel, but the export channel also has retail export and food service exports and industrial. But we won't talk about exports at this particular juncture. So now that you've seen others do it, do you have a good product idea to promote your, your honey? Are you inspired to progress to the next level? Every brand has a story, and we know from the survey that we just did that every retailer and consumer wants to hear a good story from you about Fiji honey. And we know, of course, that Fiji customers love honey and need to know why your brand exists. And the benefits, of course, that your honey can provide them and their families. So you can look at your peers in the industry also online and see what they are doing to make themselves successful. Now you can get help here, right? So if you are inspired by this session and need help, reach out to someone for assistance. Certainly someone you can trust who can test your ideas and provide you some guidance. Right, you might need to get some creative graphic design skills to help you with all the things that we have discussed today, particularly about your brand selection, your brand design, your logo and your positioning. You'll need someone to help you maybe solve some choice of the colors um, and customization, right? And to come up with that brand image um, that you can consistently apply in your product. And then you need to progressively test this over time and improve it. You won't get it right first up. But all those brands that we saw today have progressively improved their image and their appearance over many, many years of consistently continuous improvement. And then I want you to reality check against the marketplace. Does it have that uniqueness? 
Is it legible? Right? And how does it apply um, online and maybe in social media applications? So I've got a small hint there about some of, some of those larger brands also need a website. Um, and it's important in your brand selection that you do go and check your URL to ensure that it hasn't been taken by somebody else in the marketplace. Um, and that's a final tip before you actually go ahead and register your brand because you need to make sure that no one else is registered. So in a summary, creating a brand requires a solid foundation of research and analysis. It takes time and patience and effort. And there is a big difference, I wanna to say tonight, between a brand and a label, right? Um, and we will go deeper into labeling at some other point of time. Let me say that a product is what you sell, a brand is the image of that product, and branding is a strategy to create that image. So thank you. And remember, branding is like beekeeping. 